process that we undertook last year. Um, keeping in mind that um, this is not where we will necessarily start from, but it gives us something to have a conversation about. Um, and then we can adjust downward, upward, outward, and inward um, wherever we need to. Um, I'm presenting it to you, uh, to this finance committee first. Um, I, I wanted to have a joint session with the school board as well, but they're uh, busy at the, at the moment with school just getting started. So the goal is to uh, hopefully have a joint meeting with them in the near future, meaning maybe next week, so that we can, the six of us, and as well as our experts being um, finance directors for both sides and both uh, managers for both sides, uh, get together and kind of get a consensus on where we want to then present this to the council. Um, High level overview is that this is really an executive level summary of what we hope to begin that process. Um, the goal is a qualitative assessment about how we began that budget process that will interview the major participants primarily, interview the school board members, interview the town council members, interview key staff that are identified both boards. Um, obviously. The town side is a little smaller, so it's a little easier um, from our staff perspective. So it's primarily maybe the department heads that will be, give input. And then the school board can decide on their side, obviously the superintendent being a key factor in that, as well as uh, Kate, the finance director. Um, the goal is to take um, all of our um, comments from that process of last year, good, bad, and different, um, coagulate that together through a facilitator. Um, um, the resumes of the facilitator and then also the gentleman who will help with the data research around this, um, the data analytics piece, which is the second part, um, are included in the proposal um, as well, is to then hopefully have work sessions in which um, a subgroup of our boards, because obviously, personally, I don't think it should be all 14 of us, but maybe if that's what you guys decide, that's what we'll do, but a subgroup will be tasked to sit down, identify what is a desirable process going forward. Um, and um, as elected stewards, our goal is to then support that and go through a process where we can then evaluate it over time and adjust it um, as we see fit. One piece I forgot to mention is that in addition to this work group of um, elected officials and hired staff is that we will be inviting um, key constituents that participated in that process. Obviously, um, there was a large contingency on both sides of what I'll call the uh, the tax um, advocates, uh, tax conscious advocates, as well as the pro, what could be called the pro schools. We're not going to be able to uh, interview all 1,800 or so um, active participants, but we'll, f we'll try to determine who are the one or two key leaders in that groups to help us participate and find solutions. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Chris Siazzo and Christine Messengill, who are here. Um, Donna Beely was also invited, but could not make it. Um, and George is out of town and busy at the George Untwistle, the superintendent. So um, this is kind of my official presentation to you for consideration. Um, please keep in mind, and I'll send it electronically as well. I don't think George has seen this. Tom has seen a little bit of it. Um, please share that this is a beginning process, that a beginning step. It is not by any means um, embedded into any stone. Um, the secondary piece of this is that there's been a little talk about a desire to have some type of efficiency controls or efficiency consultants come in and look at operations both on the town side. This is not that proposal or that effort. This is solely about the town council's budget process, its engagement and relationship with the school board in that process, and then its engagement with the citizens in the referendum process to hopefully make that process better. So I don't want anyone to think that um, this is that effort. Um, there is, a, of course, um, an expenditure to this that the council will have to um, discuss. Uh, I know I've discussed it with um, the chair of the finance committee on the school side, um, that there may be an opportunity to share in that expense. It's, I believe, um, I think it was ten or $15,000 approximately for the, all the work. Um, we can talk that through. There is a significant amount of pro bono work that's being done by one of the partners and consultants because he is a Scarborough resident um, and he offered to do that. That's why I went to him and didn't really seek out three proposals because free work is always welcome. Um, so uh, this is just informational only. Uh, but, you know, um, if you can think about this and then share comments later uh, by email, we'll put it as an agenda item for the future um, as well. Primarily it will be at the joint session that we can then have. So. 
Um, I hope this at least continues the dialogue around the budget process so that everyone is still engaged in that because the budget's going to get started here pretty quickly. So any quick comments? Tom, do I need to provide anything? Um, we can probably talk later about anything that you need once this gets rolling. Sure. Yeah. Or how to I'd like to, I have some initial thoughts, but I'll yeah. provide them in writing for everyone to see. Absolutely. Um, I, your point of timeline is important. I think it's important. This is likely to be a two to three month process, I suspect. Yeah. And that unfortunately already puts us right at the holiday season and at the doorstep of budget. So right. it's, <clears throat> it's imperative that we do you know, get a direction and get moving, I think, for us to have something that we can use for this next, next process. Yep. And um, I, I did want to mention that um, while this is a draft, and we'll make sure that it's documented as a draft, I do want to offer that it is available. I'll, um, I'm going to provide the manager with a copy electronically. Um, we'll tag it as such. Um, the, the key point to uh, bring in is, and I want anybody to be able to read this and see it and know what we're participating in. There needs to be some perspective brought into this and that you have to start someplace. So I hope people, as they read this, don't overreact to it because it can, it's a dynamic issue and it's going to change. So that's enough on that part. So thank you. Thank you guys very much for coming. I know you have meetings, so if you have to thank, appreciate that. Um, to the regular agenda, the first item is the discussion and review of financial statements for the year ending June 30th, 2015. Um, I'm going to turn this. There are three documents that we have received. No, two documents, which is the balance sheet and income, income statement, financial statements. And with that, I'm going to turn that over to Tom and Ruth. And I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. I'll just make a, a couple comments off the top. These are unaudited. There's still some inner fund. There's still some behind-the-scenes accounting that will occur. Any big adjustments? I mean, any unbooked Expenses at this point? There, there may be, and may it be. may be easier for us to kind of flag those as we go. Okay. Uh, um, and so let's get uh, let's have Ruth get started, and by all means, stop her uh, if if you have questions, and we'll try to flag those um, works in progress as we go as well. Okay, great. Uh, we can start with the balance sheet if you like. Uh, not sure what you yes. what I can say about it other than the one pager. It's is what it is. We have assets as of June again unaudited. The number has probably decreased significantly on the asset side since June 30th as we utilize those funds. Um, so we have huge due from other funds. That's all part of the year-end process that we go through. Some of it has to do with, for example, the Haigus Parkway, the funds that are owed by the uh, people we have agreements with. Mm -hmm. We have tax liens outstanding. This is all tax liens, not just last year's, but all the tax liens that are mm -hmm. out there. Even though those tax liens are probably tax acquired at this point and we foreclosed on them, we still show them because if they try to sell their property or uh, whatever, we, we can still, we have first right of first collection. So we continue to show those on the books. Just to, incidentally, I have been successful in conveying five properties back uh, wow. to former owners. Uh, those monies are paid back against those back liens, so that number should be, you know, will be adjusted accordingly as we receive those funds. And for the citizens, we're looking at just under uh, $955,000 in unpaid tax liens as of June 30th. But again, as the months go on in the current fiscal year, those these numbers will uh, decrease. Is that about normal? Is that where it is? That's pretty, each year end. It's pretty normal. Yeah. Just a quick question on the on the tax properties that we have taken under foreclosure. Is that the tax acquired property? I thought it would because I thought it was more it's, value. It's much higher than that. Yeah, These I was going to say the ones that we've actually um, booked on our side. I think we're working through some reconciliations between what the assessor is showing, actually what the tax office is showing, and what we're showing. Uh, so there are some reconciliations going on. I guess nobody actually made the connection between the three until last year that maybe we should be comparing all three of these. And so uh, that's ongoing. This number is, our number is by far the lowest. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was, wasn't it more like a million dollars of properties or something? Uh, I'm not sure it's it that a high. number, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, really? it was 26 properties or so. So, I, yeah, that's yeah. probably yeah. right. You're, but yeah. these are, but even though we've tax acquired them, 
they don't become tax acquired and come off the books until the council authorizes it. So even though they're, uh, we've technically tax acquired them, we're still taxing them. If we really tax acquired them, we would stop taxing them. We would not put them through the commitment and do all of that. So there's two, two, two pieces to it, mm. a little bit. How long do you tax, how long do you account for that? By law, we have right of, we, we collect the, money first, so we right. don't write them off. The only ones we've actually brought to the council to write off or uh, to actually write off are usually mobile homes that are decrepit. Uh, or, or we don't even foreclose. We, we typically don't foreclose. ask you to, ask you to stop the it. foreclosure process so we don't own them in the first place. Right. Yeah, let's assume it's a raw piece of, just so I can understand about this. Oh, understand about it. It's a raw piece of land. Forget the mobile home and some of the new, um, intrinsic pieces to that. If someone stops paying taxes on it and we foreclose on it, do we continue? So it sounds like we still continue assessing taxes on that even after it's been foreclosed? Yes. And how long do we continue taxing that if it's been foreclosed? We have taxes, I think, that go back to the 80s or 90s, maybe the 90s. Really? Even though it's been foreclosed on it? We, I, so, um, because if the person were to pass away or try to sell their house, all of those back taxes have to be uh, made good before the before the deed is released into the new owner's hands. Into that new owner's hand. Um, okay, I'm just curious because I mean I'm a banker in the sense that I used to be in bank. Once you foreclose on a, on a on a residential property, the bank becomes the owner of it and um, can't charge additional interest on the loan. We can. But so you can and you can into we perpetuity. We charge interest from 1990 all the way up until the really? day we pay it okay. today or tomorrow. I did not know that. At the various interest rates for those years, and in some of those, the past few years, it's only been seven percent, but in the past, it's been up to nine or ten percent. So, is there any is there any advantage to put the property value on the balance sheet as an asset rather than the taxes? Does it impact bond rates or anything? Is there is there a reason we'd want to gross our balance sheet up? No. The advantage to gross it up? Because regardless of where we put it, it's still an asset. Right. Well, but but the asset you the asset you have, as, if I understood it, the asset we we are recording is just the value of the back taxes. But and it, but um, it, that's true. It, right. But but if if it's a piece of property, so in this case, it would if, still just be the value of the taxes. We can't put it to market value. I guess you can't have it both ways, right? We couldn't keep. No, but what, what Peter's saying is that if you actually post the higher balance of the two, meaning the value of the property versus the value of the taxes, and I heard um, a Bernie in the back row say it can't based on law. Based on That's law. That's right. The accounting law says that we have to use um, not market value, historical value. Okay. So it would be the value at the time we took possession. But, but but uh, again, just plain devil's advocate, if it was a million dollar piece of property that you took at the time of possession, would there be any advantage to think about accounting policy changes that we take, change our methodology if it if there's an advantage to grossing up the assets on our balance sheet for terms of bond interest rates or any of those types of things? It's more than just town's accounting policy. It's the governmental accounting standard boards. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Practices okay. that we... Have Thank to you. Yep. Um, so, you know, we have assets of at June 30th of roughly about $18 million. The liabilities, we have a policy in place for the town um, that says that because we were written up from the auditors in the past, because we would continue, if we get invoices in today, for example, but they're dated June, we were charging them back or we weren't charging them back and we'd get, you know, we were written up because we weren't, the school got written up for a huge one last year, I think, or the year before for their Wentworth construction. So we, at their recommendation, put a policy in place that said at August 31st, we will no longer, that's our policy deadline date. If you don't have your invoices into us for last year, we're just gonna charge them to the current year. And so that's what we've started to do. Um, hopefully that will ward off the, the uh, Slow invoicing. Comment from the auditors. Yeah. Um, I believe the school is still doing that, but I, that might just be an oversight that we didn't pass that policy on to them for adoption. So, you know, hopefully we'll be doing that and they'll either adopt it or they won't. That will be their choice to do. And what's the, what's the performance guarantee? Performance guarantees are have mostly to do with the planning department. If a subdivision or a 
business goes in and they're essentially done except for X, what they will do is they will give the town money to hold. And either as they complete the process, we release some of those funds. Okay. If they don't, we keep the money and we finish whatever it is. So that's a guarantee for them to perform. Thank you. We have also uh, the accrued payroll number that is there is right now is the schools, but as you can imagine, between June, June 30th and today, those funds have been used up paying the staff. Um, we have funds that are due to the state, due to other funds within the town. The accounting laws require us to record two months' worth of tax collections, outstanding tax collections, um, and we can show those as a deferred tax, which means we can show them against the current the 2015 taxes, even though we've collected them in July and August. Um, that number has not been updated. That was the number from last year, so we're still working on some of these numbers. Taxes collected in advance are uh, after between March and now when we actually commit the taxes and run the tax bills. People pay their 2016 taxes before we actually have a tax bill. So huh? what we do is we can't record it anywhere because it's uh -huh. we record it as a liability. And then once the taxes are committed, we transfer those funds over. Which leaves us to fund balance. We have, per accounting rules again, we have various types of fund balances. The, the last four are pretty much the estimated revenues and appropriations, and then the actual revenues and expenditures for school and town. The difference between normally estimated revenues agree with appropriations. However, because we also have purchase orders that we carry forward from one year to the next, that's the difference between those two numbers. And then we have the revenues and expenditures, and um, right now we're showing that we've spent about 30, uh, I'll go total, we've spent about 74,522,000 out of a 70, almost $77 million budget. Um, as I said, we're still working through some of the expenditures and transfers. For example, um, the last item under the town general fund is other. That includes a lot of the TIFs and credit enhancement agreements that we do fund transfers with. So some of those are done, some of those are not done. So we're in the process of working on those. Is it, and I guess this is where it gets to, is it, so you're showing that there's still available budget of $2 million or so. So it's under budget by $2 million, right? Yeah. And, and so yeah. are, are our adjustments going to be close to that $2 million, or is it actually, are we, I can't say at this point. We have accrued sick we haven't posted, accrued vacation that's not posted, the town's accrued wages haven't been posted. Um, there's a lot of journal adjustments that need to be made. It's a, it's a very, it's a long process to well, go through each of these funds. I think what we can say is that on the town side, we will end up in a positive situation. We'll turn an annual budget surplus. Uh, Ruth's not able to give you a, you know, a much more than that at this point. I believe on the school side, they will as well, and I think they'll um, they'll meet the expectation that was given to the to the council at the end of the budget process. The two hundred ish, or to be used twice, well, my four fifty or something. Yeah, I think it was north of that. It was a higher number. Okay. Uh, they're and showing eight sixty six, and that includes t you know in total town and school uh, town and school revenues and expenditures. I think we will have a a surplus going back. The second page is are the revenues. And you can see that, and I'm, I feel a little bit more comfortable about this page than I do the expenditure page. Mm. Uh, okay. The taxes are high, that's attributable mostly to the excise tax. Additional revenues we received this year. There's some detail on that on the last page, but we can so, wait to get there. I think I... A lot of new cars. I'm a little bit uh, confused. So the first page I have looks like expenditures because the bottom line says total general fund expenditures. Yes. You're talking about 
revenue? We're the next page. Page two. Just okay, next year page two. Oh, okay, yep. I'm sorry. And that shows we're a little short, but you're saying, but that's probably. No, it shows there's a net surplus of 184,000. The town has a net surplus. The school has uh, a deficit. Oh, gotcha. But on a net basis, we're up 184,000. Right. Less than what? It did, uh, you're right. Less it's than what you thought. That is deficit. You're right. Yes, yeah. thank you. And But you think that's solid? That That's not going to change? So I we're, don't. Okay. So we're close on revenue, just a little bit I off, think we're close on revenues, off. right. But, you know, also, whenever we use fund balance, we don't record the usage. And I believe this school used 200,000 fund balance in 2015. Don't quote me on that. But so that's, yeah, that's not the reflected in these numbers that. either, because the auditors will just make us undo the journal. Cause we okay. do so um, just to kind of. Um, been a while since I looked at the financial statements. A negative revenue is an excess amount of revenue, correct? Correct. It's a surplus. Yes. So a positive is actually a deficit. deficit. So the general fund revenues has a surplus of 659000 Mostly due to excise. excise. That's Primarily all. excise, which is where why we adjusted our original forecast within the budget to kind of absorb some of that for the overall tax rate. Mm -hmm. And then on the school side, there is a projected deficit of 844,000. So the net to the town is 184. Right, and it's probably not quite that high because they were planning to use some of their fund balance, which does not is not reflected in that. Oh, okay. In that oh, that's right, because when they budgeted during the, they budgeted at the beginning of the year, they expected to use yeah, right. some fund balance. Okay. The excise. Yeah. Ruth, what line does the excise show up in? It's the very first one under taxes. Taxes, yeah. And if, I, not to confuse you, eight hundred thousand. The school yeah, plan. Yeah, eight hundred. So if we had close to that eight hundred thousand as revenue, it'd be right they'd on target. Be Thirty-six thousand. Right on target. Under. So to answer your question, Councilor Donovan, I, I don't mean to confuse it, but the final page in this packet shows uh, just a, a better view. It isolates excise tax. So we had budgeted 439, and we received 5.026. So that is clearly the. Which the, page is that? It's, it's the, it's very the last, last one. page in the packet. Last page. Okay. Is that first line? We could organize this differently. Just I see it. Thank yeah, you. I would yeah, that actually might No, help thank you. Bit. And that was a real surprise, a delight, but a surprise nonetheless, uh, just with that. Amazing experience mm -hmm. that, that bucked all of historical yeah. trends during the last at least five years. Yeah. So I wanted to add just to, a couple of refreshes and one question. Charge for services, is that interdepartmental revenue? That could be anything from um, somebody uses our rescue billing, our rescue services, and we bill them for it. So we're charging okay. them for the services. Uh, we receive a few, a couple of bucks for every vehicle regis we register. So it's not interdepartmental. So like it, uh, it could be. Some oh, of it could, could be. be. Okay, all right. Um, Community services, all of well, that. Well, that's what I because I, yeah, I know that there's some departments will charge another department. Um, so that's some of that is in inter, there too. Intra public works charges the departments for vehicle maintenance. And right. It's there. Right. And that's um, mis uh, miscellaneous revenues is the other significant item, which is the three hundred twenty nine thousand um, dollars in. Revenues over projections. Um, does that include the bonding, the favorable bonding issue? Is that in that line? You know, we uh, got a premium back for the bond. The premium is included in that. Yes. That's in the so that's a, a the big factor for the miscellaneous increase. Yes. And then other financing sources is a deficit of eight hundred sixty-one thousand. What is other financing sources? The general obligation bonds go there. Uh, we have various inter fund transfers that go there so for example we estimated that we were going to bond a million six we actually only bonded a million five for various projects oh, that's good so yeah and then the other ones okay. were some uh, miscellaneous revenues we get for leasing pine point co-op was one higgins beach lease is another one 
Have those not been posted? Those have been posted. The ones that haven't been are the intergovernmental ones. So the general obligation bond, if we actually bond less than projected, you would also see some favorable adjustment on the expense side because it would not be in debt service? It could be that we've as started well as to the spend. Liabilities. It could be that we've started to spend the funds, but we didn't have enough spent in order to bond. Okay. So those Nope. Could be the the other two that haven't been posted yet under financing sources that are major are uh, essentially the school development impact fees. That's a transfer out as the money comes in. We stick it into an investment account so it earns interest, and then we pull out not last year's. I think it's the year before's actual revenues, and that's how we. So we always have a known figure when we go to estimate that revenue. The other one is the Hygus Parkway assessments. The assessments. Uh, payments show in another fund and then we take the monies out of that fund to help fund the general fund debt so in both those cases there are certainly revenues there are revenues in both from both sources that aren't reflected there yet correct so that number is going to get better yep. and um, as of June 30th we were 98.8 percent tax collected which is very high, very good for the town. The next page is um, the school's budget broken out by categories that we use in our audit. So if I'm reading this right, my, is it, so if I look at the school budget revenue, it was 41,000,000.3. The school expenditures was 41.3. So virtually, you know, they're even. they're even, but they had rolled into that you said you hadn't booked was the $800,000 of reserve. So that means they're going to end the year with 800000 in reserves, right? Right. So they essentially they won't need to touch that, which will allow them to use it for this year. What rolls into to next year, which right. we thought it was going to be a different number. So that's, that's good news. Yeah. I believe, yeah. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? The, it, at this stage, right. the, the revenues and expenditures for the school are essentially even without using the school's fund balance. So they, had a, they, they thought they were going to have to use the yep. 800000 reserve to carry them, and what this is showing, they're not going to use that, so that should say next year when we look at the budget, there should be 800 in reserves that become available to make decisions about whatever. And I will qualify all of this with it's still an auditor. Right. So right. the auditor is right. actually right, 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 blessing. Right, right, right. <laughs> These could change. At least it's looking in the right direction. It's looking in the right direction. Yes. And then uh, the next page is. Let me, let me just, oh, before you leave that, the, the original appropriation revised budget figures, uh, obviously they're identical. Um, but what they have in there is the assumption that they were going to the school was going to spend $800,000 worth of fund balance monies. Correct. Uh, turns out they didn't spend that. So, okay, so I, I see why it's a wash. The next page is just the other funds, if you will. Special revenue funds are funds mm -hmm. that are created either by the council by other boards, by other agencies that we have to do. So, for example, grants are considered special revenue. We have to show them separate than we do in the general fund. Mm -hmm. um, the Payne Road development impact fees that we have out there, school development impact fees. We have, uh, we are self-insured for unemployment. So we have those types of things. The beach reserves are under here. Beach reserves are under which account? The special revenue funds. And so the first group are town and then school special revenue. Well, the other funds are special revenues, capital projects, both school and town each have two different funds for capital projects. One is considered major, one is considered minor. Uh, I think that's a, uh, we've kind of copied the school, but the school, I think the state requires that difference. Uh, we also have, the town has cemetery trust funds, permanent funds they're called now, and the school has the scholarship funds. So the first two sections are expenditures in both of those categories, and then the next two sections are revenues. 
So, so looking at this, if I if I look at other town fund expenditures for the town, it was seven point four million, and other other town revenues fund reserves were seven point. So that's virtually a wash. The two top ones are both expenditures. Right, but oh I, yeah, but, oh the seven four. But, yes, but, yes. But if I look at the town expenditures and the revenue, it's a wash. If Correct. I look at the yes. school expenditures versus the school revenues. We're short about four million dollars. Where did the how did that get funded? Part of that will probably be the seventy three hundred, which is where the Wentworth school expenditures were. Those right. revenues were probably three point six million on those year. capital projects. So I would say the bulk of that three million expenditures are bonded funds that we've already shown as a revenue in a prior year. So if you look at the school fund expenditures, the second category, second line, second school line. capital projects fund 3.589. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm virtually certain that's the Wentworth. the final cost of the Wentworth oh, School. I see. Oh, I see what you're saying. And then if you, if you look for the offset yeah. in, down below in the revenue, it doesn't show there. That's it was already booked. That's million right there. Yeah. It was booked in the prior year. So, okay. So it was yeah. timing issue. Timing issues, right? It's when the bond monies come in and when they spend the funds. The school still does does have a few um, what do you call them? Tick items that they have to go through on the Wentworth <coughs> before it's totally closed out. I checked with Wins. Yeah, I checked with uh, Kate over at school department, and she said that they're they're getting close, but they're not quite there yet. So she's hoping to have something okay. soon that we can all bless and. Close out. Go from there. Absolutely. And then, as Tom mentioned, on the very, very last page are just some selected revenues, and then we have revenues by department on the town side. And the town and the, the investment interest that looks so huge and out of whack is because of that bond premium. Yeah, that's right. And the two things that are you know, from a trending point of view, excise tax collection and building permits, those are two pretty good canaries in the coal mine in terms of Mark, healthy know, economy. Com you know, comfort in the economy, consumerism and all of that. Um, as you well know, in the current fiscal year, you know, we continue to expect that trend will continue in a, in a similar direction. I think we weren't foolish in, in our projections, but uh, we were anticipating uh, additional growth in excise and pretty much static growth in building permits, but that's a great sign to actually see that number starting to move right north. It's kind of the economy, though. The building permits go up, but plumbing and electrical permits go down. <laughs> Must be, it's, yeah. it's actually been funny because when the building permits were down, the electrical and plumbing were actually high. Must be a timing issue again, right? The permits. Either well, that I think or it's they're new doing as opposed, more local. It's new, it's new construction as opposed to reno renovations. I, um, I think that might have something to do with it. They renovate rather than build if they're if we're in a soft economy. <laughs> right. Cool. Yeah, they're converting existing space yep. rather than building their own. Um, this is great. Um, what so I the, the one question I want to ask, maybe um, as a recommendation going forward, having a and I'm trying to think on, on which number. Having a comparative point for a prior year, even though they're unaudited, would be extremely useful so that you can kind of see where our, you know, particularly where is the fund, you know, I'm interested in our total fund balance. Is that up or down in comparison to last year as well as some of these others? So we um, could do this, so we have it in yeah, June 30, um, 15 and June 30, 14, or yeah, July, the, whatever. Yeah, whatever the previous right, yeah, period is. The p previous period is, just so that at least from a visual uh, pinpoint, you can look at it and kind of determine, because with this, I, I don't know even where to even start commenting, except for um, is it possible to determine um, policies that are impacted by our financial statements? So as an example, our fund balance policy and where are we. So we do um, obviously a total fund balance for the town, mm -hmm. and then we do the town, uh, the, I'm sorry, the school, and we have a policy for the town. You know what I'm saying? And there's right, different yeah. levels of measurement for that. Um, I think that will help me in understanding a little bit about this um, nuance of um, deficits and surpluses and not posting um, use of surplus funds and the actual impact of the fund balance. Um, 
So that would be, and I don't know if you're comfortable, at least even in a draft format, to kind of understand where we are with that. Um, I think it will help um, a lot. We'll never exceed the policy because I think it's, what, 10%? If we ever go over 10% in fund balance or something like that, then we have to put it towards capital projects. I'm sure that we didn't gain that much this year. No, we're still below. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so I kind of like just to see where that is, if you don't mind. Is, is, Ruth, is there anything that uh, 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 has yet not been booked or which doesn't show up yet on the financials that will, in your mind, materially change anything? The accrued wages on the town <laughs> side will. Okay. We'll probably do that. That's essentially probably this year. It's probably a week and a half worth of um, wages. I mean, they're posted in the current year, but 2016. But because they were quote unquote earned in 2015, we have to book them back. Mm. And so uh, that will have to. The school, I believe, has done the bulk of theirs. That's why that number is huge. But uh, the town still has to do theirs. That seems. But that number seems fairly normal to I historical say, numbers, isn't it? Yeah pretty consistent, right? Okay. So that's that's probably the biggest thing. The other thing that's going to impact or however however the capital and the special revenue transfers go, I mean if we have a lot of revenues in our special uh, for like our beaches and they exceed what we estimate, we put that take that out of the general fund and we put it into the special revenue fund. The same thing goes if we have more expenditures than we appropriated, we take the money out. Mm -hmm. of the special rep and give it back to the general fund. So the general fund is, we try to keep that as, as equal as possible. And what Ruth just described is, uh, has been authorized or we've been directed to do that by virtue of the fund when it was created. Um, so there'll be this, that final adjustment. Right. And that's with, you know, same thing with unemployment. We budget so much and if we exceed that, we take it out of the unemployment fund. And, and if we don't, we use that money to help fund it for future periods. So. So those are the kinds of transfers that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So big picture, we're comf we're, uh, I'm confident in saying that we're going to end up in a positive situation, and it looks like there might be ver some very good news on the school side with their yeah. performance, their use of fund balance. That would be great, mm. given, yeah. given some of the risks that are still there. Well, there was a lot of oh. consternation around use of fund balance for fiscal year 16 and what was left in uh, well, we the number of 170. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Less than 200,000 was left based right. on the program use. This obviously helps. It, it, it's, I mean, Who would that? And I was thinking to kind of build on what Sean said. I mean, we talked at one point about key sort of dashboard and metrics. And I was just thinking that, that that is a critical issue as we kind of go into the budget season. So just having a real simple dashboard and where are we on reserves? Where did we, you know, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of how to put it together, but, you know, ear, 800,000 was earmarked to be trans to be used for the school expenditures doesn't sound like we're going right, to use I that it, right so that means it would help us in just thinking ahead of the budget season if, if we had 800 ish because uh, we thought the cupboard was going to be bare I mean I think we thought we used all the dollars we had including estimates for this year and the school does go through a fairly um, involved process so that they they're I mean not that we're not doing it but they're actually they can actually they'll say to their staff you can, you have to stop spending you know yeah and and so they they do that and then they can kind of track a little bit better and then they loosen things up as they get closer to the end of the year or whatever so but I think to Peter's point I think that um, and this is why I kind of want that analysis so I can because uh, right now I'm just not doing the T accounts and kind of following this it paints a very different picture if you think that uh, if you know that you have or can project that you have a million dollars in surplus right. versus you're, you're down to the last 60,000, which is kind of where our conversation was, right. um, in which then we go and we make adjustments um, from the town's fund balance to support education, which I'm okay with. It's just that it's a very different conversation when you're at that point, as well as we then um, provide additional adjustments to the municipal budget and reduce expenditures because we think it's so dire when it's actually a very more favor it's a much more favorable picture. You can give it back to the town if you'd like. Well, <laughs> uh, no, I'll be honest. I've actually, and I'm not going to hide it. I've actually kind of, um, depending upon the outcome of the fiscal year, I've had a, at least a private conversation with a school board uh, member about if the picture was painted better, 
maybe um, as a goodwill or as a discussion, the 225 or 250, whatever that amount, I can't remember exactly the number, might be something that um, is reserved back to us because it's not something that was really needed because we did it out of, I don't want to call it desperation, but we thought, I mean, it was pretty dire at that time. I mean, we were getting cut by the state by over a million dollars. We thought our reserves were going to be down to right. almost nothing. So, so, yeah, entering this next budget conversation, having some confidence around, I'll say, not healthy, but adequate, and maybe a little extra reserve will give us all some comfort. We also won't have as many question marks. I mean, it's the second year of the state budget, so that's a done deal, and um, all of that volatility is kind of removed. The following year, we're right back in that situation mind you but at least for next fiscal year it's going to be a little much easier to predict where we're going to end up but but i guess where i was going was maybe think about if we start thinking about a process now or some type of metric because i remember part of our conversations i think some thought that they were going to end the year much better than they were projecting i mean they were using maybe 150 or so surplus and if it actually turns out to be 800 it would be great if we could have a process by which we could dial that number in a little more accurately sometime during the process. And I don't know how we do that, but maybe if we had a, a focus on it and we had a dashboard saying, okay, what did we think each side was going to use in reserves? Where did we end the year? Where are we as we look at the numbers? Mm -hmm. It would be really great if we could, we could, there's a big difference between 800,000 and, you know, 150,000. If we could get just some more confidence in some way, so I, I don't have the answer for that, but I, but I'd like to maybe think about so when we start the conversation again, that we have a little more confidence in where we think it's going to end up. It's a little bit difficult for us I know. because we I know not, not necessarily. I mean, I can come up with any kind of numbers, but the the concern is that you know from an accounting standpoint, we're always taught to be very conservative. Yep. Yeah, in the revenues, because yeah, if absolutely. they don't come in, <laughs> and you've and, and yeah. you've estimated accurately for your expenditures, no. you're going to be short, or yeah. we're going to be yeah. short, and then we're going to have issues. So. I think what we could do to, is to maybe give you some ranges and talk about the assumptions made to um, come up with those to ranges. give those bookends mm -hmm. of that range. Uh, mm -hmm. That might help. Because I remember, I, I mean, I just did a, you know, I mean, mine's not very sophisticated. It's like back of the envelope. But if you look at the surpluses after the audit that got recorded. It averaged about five hundred thousand dollars a year for the last three or four years, and once again, this will this will kind of Confirm support that, that trend. Yeah. That trend. So maybe we can do some just just a way so we can. I think that's a great suggestion, Tom. A range of possibilities of the yep. numbers. So it's so incumbent on, on Kate on the on the school, school side, side and Ruth on the town side of of spending the time to have and have confidence in those year-end projections. You know, mm -hmm. and there's some time in early in the fourth quarter of the year, there's a lot of experience left. And as Ruth says, by their very nature, they're going to be conservative. <laughs> you know, it was like pulling teeth getting Ruth, or excuse me, getting Kate, Kate to give some clarity around that. Um, she, I think in the end, when pressed, she said it's not going to be 800. I th my recollection, she said it's going to be closer to 300 was, was kind of the mm -hmm. final word from her. And in fact, it seems like it's even better than that in the final analysis. Mm. But it, you know, in this case, I mean, not, not not to beat a dead horse, but to, but to Sean's point, I mean, because we thought of where it was, that we made some decisions, we would have made different decisions otherwise, maybe. So just a good, and good conversation. Oh, the only good thing that came out of that is more fund balance in future years, which will help. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I think there's two uh, pieces from just reviewing this because um, you know we do have to move on, but two pieces from this that kind of ties into the first conversation of the information about the proposal and this whole work session on the budget proposal. It brings to light. One is um, there is, seems to be a strong desire to simplify the data because it's so complex and so big for the size of a community um, so that um, people can understand this better. While we might be more, um, our acumen may be greater, um, it can be very difficult because we provide so much information because we want to be as thorough as possible. Um, for me, I think uh, at this particular point, simply having here is what your actual fund balance is and here is what has been, um, this is what you have budgeted for the for this coming year will tell me where our real position is because it comes out of that balance, right? Um, the secondary piece to that is that it's about timing. 
and I don't know, and maybe that's going to be one of the um, um, one of the outcomes that comes from that proposal because if we had this information in advance, the conversation would have been completely different. I mean, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I mean, we wouldn't have been as, um, you know, uh, worried about the future, worried about where fund balances were going and some of our projections and things. It's just, it, and it's always about timing, right? So, um, um, but it's been very useful. So I do want to say thank you very much. And I do, I actually put it on my list. We did talk about at the beginning of the year, we talked about having this dashboard metrics approach to financial statements so that we get out of kind of the line items and look at the trends. So um, I'm going to put that on my uh, follow up for us Good. to move that forward. So, but I want to thank you. The, the, the last thing I want to say regarding the fund balance and how we've been increasing it is that we have to remember that in during the recession we were hitting it so we're yep. below our our own policy I was at a training session recently with Standard and Poor's and and they essentially said you know they look to our the communities to see whether we're following our own policies right. or right. not and well, you know whether we're yeah. so Absolutely. it's yeah you know, we need to get ourselves above that 8.33 and then you know the good news is the town's weaned itself off relying on fund balance uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, we hit it hard, and then we've gone cold turkey for the last four budget cycles, yeah. and it's allowed us to go yeah, back. We had it hard, what, in 2011? Uh, two or two years. successive years, 2009, 10, 10, 10, and maybe 11. Uh, I mean, nine, but we, we simply, the council at the time, yeah. uh, I remember it. The recession started in, what, 08, I think? It yeah, and by 09, everyone realized we were in the midst of a, a real um, dead spot, and uh, the council didn't want to be part of the problem. Uh, they wanted to be part of the solution, so they held the mill rate static, and they funded it with fund balance, essentially. Right. Yeah. Great. There Thank were also you. cuts that year, but um, fund balance was used heavily. Um, if there's no more questions on that item, uh, moving on to item number five, discussion on rescinding bond orders. Yeah, this grouping of projects, you'll see, they date back all the way back to the 94-95 time frame. These are projects that had been previously approved by councils, passed, uh, and these are the amounts of monies um, not yet bonded, but there's still authorization that exists on the books. And so Ruth and Gina are tasked with continuing to account for these things, and we verified in consultation with staff that these projects are done, there will be no more money expended, and so this is me, me, really just a housekeeping matter to kind of clean these off our books. Um, don't get excited. This money exists on paper only. It's not as right. if by your action uh, this money is all, all of a sudden available to us. There's a much shorter list of projects that fall into that category, and that's monies that have been approved, bond funds have been received, and they will no longer be needed because the project either came in on budget or for whatever reason didn't happen. That's a list that we're working on now. We'd like to bring that to you as soon as we can, and that's money actually that needs to be redirected somewhere else, whether it's to fund future capital. I, I, that, that will be a recommendation uh, that we, we do, in fact, that. And we can only use it to either reduce debt right. or for other capital. We can't just, you know. <laughs> can't put it in a rainy day fund. Right. Yeah. Um, even though that's coming later, how much is that approximately, that amount? Um, I mean, this is just for the public. This is $4.4 .4 million right. that we will release. It might, or 4.35. I don't have my bright glasses on, but yeah. how much is that other amount? I what have, um, I know of at least two. There's one that's at least 800000 in projects right. that are, there's three or four of those projects. And we might have two bond issues that have about 800 in each one that's wow. uh, unspent. I know one of them. One of them I know we owe 500000 to for the Dunstan-ish project yep. right. um, yeah. that, that hasn't been paid out. But uh, so, you know, those are Do you have a ballpark? That's as, that's as safe as I'm going to be willing to go because what I haven't. What was the number that? The, 800 to 2.4 million. Eight, oh, 1.6. Oh, so it would be 1.2. We'll say 1 million six. bucks is what 1. Is where 2 we to 1.6. I would say Less. closer to a million yeah. closer by the time we do okay. the final. Okay. And that's monies that uh, we have uh, secured the bonds? We have the bond proceeds, correct. And the, so we have the proceeds. And we've spent some of it. We might not have spent all of it. Some of it may be, you know, little bits of monies that yeah. is so unspent. But some of it might be some. Obviously, you can't undo 
what's done. Right. We have the bond proceeds. We have the money. We can't say, okay, take it back and reduce our bond. No. Oh, right. I mean, we so, have the bonds. We have the debt. We're paying right. interest. So That's right. And so now we, we have a, a, a limited number of options as to how that money can be used. Correct. Okay. And, um, I got you. Like this, I think it, you know, we'll bring it to, to the Finance Committee, but I think ultimately it needs to be approved by the full, full, full council. council. And, uh, the use of the money. To use, to, for the even, use of the even money. This, uh, and even uh, this, to yeah. release the bond. We could um, hold, yeah, we brought this to you yeah. because it's ready. Uh, we Absolutely. could hold it for the other one so that at least the two come at the same time, or we could advance them right away to um, council. I'm okay with it. Uh, I don't know if we need to take a... Because this is just paperwork. I mean, this, this is, is just paperwork, right. so... Whereas the other one is going to be associated with a recommendation as to uh, what, what to do, the money what to do with paperwork. it. So, so for the purposes of uh, just formality, I'd move approval to accept order, the order rescinding unused and unneeded bonded indebtedness authority with all of the items that are listed adding up to a total release of $4,346,404 um, and that we forward this recommendation to the full board. Second. Second. Any discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor? Great. It's three. So Excellent. would you like us to advance this now? Yes, that would be great. great. I Thank you. Think so. yep. Great. Now, I just want to make sure as far as... Is confused to... Yes. yes. People, they think, yeah. People go, this is sort of bonded and unbonded, received right. and unreceived. So let's get this out of the way. And, and it, you know, it, it looks like it's a huge number, but really the bulk of it is the Wentworth School that we authorize right. through the citizen vote yep. that we're not... So the, the two things, one is a comment and then a question. The first comment is I think that this is a... Even though there's a lot of detail, um, it is testament to the fact that our staff, after we approve a project, do work diligently in doing what is best for the community and trying to be um, cost efficient. I mean, we, we approved and guarantee these are, in essence, um, some projects that go back to, I mean, some smaller projects that go back to 97. I mean, there's, we underspent all of these projects by $4.4 .4 million, and so I think that's a big testament. The question I have, though, is that um, other than being a technical uh, paper uh, push here, does this impact our financial uh, rating? Um, if we don't release these, how, does it impact our financial rating? The bond, it could affect the bond ratings because it can, they, okay. they look at this as potential items that we're going to... Even, even though it's something was approved in 95, the Wentworth Energy Improvement... So this really, they do? Okay, the budget authorization right, exists, so that's yeah. the direction so to staff to spend it. Technically do that. The Oak Hill building, for example, yeah. that would have been a taxable bond if we had done that project. And so we did do the project. Oh, uh, that would make sense then. We did do the project because it's being used by other than, you yeah. know, government. However, at that point in time, we had available funds, and, and the manager at the time decided to not bond it, and we would just use available funds to do yeah. that with. So. Yeah. Good. Okay. This has been 10 years in the works. Nope, this is I great. Mean, it, it, we've known this stuff is, is there, and it's finally got to the point, particularly with Wentworth, that's a big number, 3.2 million in authorized borrowing that we, we know we exactly. don't need. So yeah. let's clear it off the books yeah. move on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the next item, it's item number six, which is a discussion on the capital budget policy. Um, Tom, yeah, I'll start. And Ruth start. can certainly chime in. Ruth and I think Gina, to some extent, uh, did some research around. Interestingly enough, there's not many. In fact, there, there's really no good policies that we could put our hands on. We uh, we did some old, good old-fashioned internet research and came up with a number of different kind of source materials. None of them were really put together in a coherent policy format. Uh, we also talked to our financial advisor, who's been very helpful in past policies. Um, and he wasn't aware, didn't have anything readily available, nor none of his clients uh, have one. So uh, a bit surprising to us. So this is a bit of a, it's not a hodgepodge. I think it does make some sense, and, and there's meaning behind each and every of these uh, sections. But I think it's, I view it as still a work in progress. And uh, the sorts of things that, at a very minimum, I think this policy needs to do is for all of, our, for all of us is to really establish those thresholds. What is what is capital and what is operating, uh, just by definition? Mm -hmm. And there's some questions that need to, blanks that need to be filled in in that regard. Um, and there's any number of ways you can measure that. Dollar amount is threshold, longevity of the item. Uh, those are points for discussion and we're interested in, in including you in that conversation if you like. 
And I would also make a recommendation that we try to include the school department, because if we could get them to adopt this as well, I, I their that. whole capital, uh, you know, some of those recurring things that they do every year, their roofing projects are out there, or they're washing the floors, or I'm not sure what it is, but there's there's certain things that are every year they're there, and no, that's not, yeah. they're just, yeah. to me, that's operating, but, you yeah. know. That's and, and nor do we see a multi-year plan from them. We typically, late in the budget process, get a capital plan budget for their upcoming fiscal year, but we don't see a multi-year plan, and I think that's a real important piece here. Absolutely. Uh, you'll notice I introduced the notion that we should have, you know, a couple of background materials that feed into this, uh, such as a long-range facility plan yeah. that has a very long mm -hmm. outlook, a 20-year outlook. Right. Um, on the town side, we use uh, equipment replacement schedules that um, very clearly inform what comes forward and when. And, and those are the sorts of um, input mechanisms that see themselves ultimately in a capital plan. And then one other thing that we noticed, I think happened with the high school addition project that they had was that uh, after the project was done, then all of a sudden all these operating costs that were going to be new came into the budget that, you know. As capital that were, you know, budgeted under the capital, but now, you know, greater heating costs or greater maintenance for whatever, or telephones or whatever it was, because they didn't have all those, that part of the building before, but now they did. And, and those things were kind of a surprise at the time for, for everybody that, hey, you know, why is your budget going up? It was supposed to be more efficient. And uh, so we've built into this too, is, you know, what happens after you finish your capital project? What are the operating costs going to be over the next few years so we can, build that into a budget so we know, you know. And in terms future. of prioritization, life cycle costs, those that are cheaper to run, um, we're saying should get priority. Those should be advanced mm -hmm. before others. And the other one is preservation of existing facilities. Let's look to do um, what we can within our existing mortar, you know, uh, bricks and mortar as yep. opposed to building new and, and understanding what those costs are. So it's it's long overdue and important to have uh, a more cohesive approach as, as to how we're going to manage capital needs going forward. Very good. Very good. Um, so two questions. Uh, first, I, I liked your statement about um, influencing and understanding the operational costs associated with the capital projects because one of the things that you, we hear, at least I have in the past year, you know, this community approves, um, uh, what was it, a $33 million project for Wentworth, whatever that is, $35 million project for Wentworth, but yet we're surprised when it's fully operational about what it costs. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to me that the two are not conjoined together um, when we're making the decision for that. So I, I really like where we're going with this. Um, so what I wanted to suggest, I have not been able to really think through the whole thing. I do like it. I did at least get to review it. Um, I'd like to take the time and uh, review this and then maybe bring this up um, for like an in-depth conversation and then maybe some type of an approval um, at our next meeting. Okay. Um, if it's okay with the rest of the, the mm -hmm. committee, um, Tom and Ruth, have you had a chance to talk to the school's uh, managers about uh, coming up with a, a joined um, or partner with them with regarding a capital planning policy for both sides that are, e that are comparable? It was in my head to do it. I'm not sure that at the timing actually yeah. happened to, mm -hmm. to be able to do that with the, with the sure. everything. Um, now that we have something in writing, we're pleased to share this and say yeah, this is the direction we're heading. And yeah, I was just going to suggest is that rather than having us uh, kind of uh, um, get into that process, if you two kind of being, you know, the four of you can do that together and then maybe as part of our conversation, we can have everyone at the table to talk about it so that it influences both sides. Maybe mm -hmm. we can get a grouped uh, decision regarding that part. Sean, so. if you could, and all of you, if you could do this with your school colleagues, just kind of whisper in their ear yep. so they're aware of it, that's always helpful too. Absolutely. Can you send this to me electronically? Certainly. Yep. I'll definitely talk to my counterpart, um, the chair of the Finance Committee, Chris Siazzo. We make sure that it has the draft watermark. It's still in process, oh. yes. in progress. <laughs> um, and wide open for suggestions, please, once Absolutely. you dig into this, if yeah, there's yeah. something this, we're missing. This, this is totally can be changed yeah. by yeah. anyone and everyone. I mean, it, I thought it was interesting because I actually I looked at it, but, I mean, one of the questions become are laptops a capital item well, or, or not a capital item? And this starts to give some structure that you could hmm? kind of make, you know, have a, a, a guideline that would hmm. suggest one way or the other. So uh, some of the guidelines in here might suggest that those aren't necessarily 
a capital item. Um, the, the Government Finance Officers Association, which is the governing body for us, recommends that for capital items, it should usually be more than a year, that it will last more than a year. Um, the dollar amount changes depending on, you know, who you're talking to, but it's supposed to be a major item. You know, personally, I would like to see anything above 100,000 individual item. I think that's might be a little bit too steep for, you know, some other towns or for some of us. So, you know, 15,000 to me, which is one one community had 15,000, to me is too low. But you know, so there's there's room for that number. Yeah, remember the other real practical reason for having a capital budget is to is to is really for comparative purposes. Um, laptops a great example. It's because of what it is and its life expectancy, all those, it doesn't really fit intuitively into capital, but a million dollar expenditure in the operating budget is the tail that wags a dog. It, it really throws you out of whack. And there is value, I think, in pulling out those unique and extraordinary costs so it doesn't foul up your operating. So you can actually have some um, comparative analysis ability. Um, that alone would throw things out of whack. Some would pick up the financials and say, why did the school spend a million bucks more last year than they did the year before? But, but, but the counter to that was is their argument, sort of was, I think, is, you know, we always have a software upgrade or a technology upgrade, they call it. It's about a million half dollars a year. We're going to do it every year. It's just, where, where are we going to do it? So then, if it's all technology upgrades and it's going to be, yeah. Then, then it gets over that hurdle of it being something unusual. So I just think it's fair enough. But this is a great start yep. to get at something that. And then the other thing is if we can start to move some of those types of things out of the bond arena and into the appropriated <coughs> arena, then, then you know, when it gets into the tax base, but then it's it's we're not bonding <laughs> three thousand dollar laptops, you know, even though we're bonding maybe a thousand of them, but you know, which makes it the huge number. Yeah, and that's the other thing that is this we we intend this to address and maybe it needs to be beefed up is that there's I think a some misunderstanding if something's in capital some people I think think it automatically it's all long term financed and that's not the case. Some of it is appropriated, some of it is using reserve funds, some of it is very, very short term financing. Uh, so just by virtue of it being in capital doesn't necessarily mean oh. it, it's long term general obligation bonds. Um, countless times in this policy we say the financing method ought to track the expected life expectancy mm -hmm. of the of the item right and so um, and, and we've had long had that practice uh, for a long time but I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that people think just assume automatically that it's capital we've got long-term debt that we're dealing with and that's not necessarily the case we make a decision item by item, and that comes as part of our budget recommendation to you. And we do rec uh, refer back both the debt management policy and the capital policy kind of go hand in hand together. They're both referenced. Well, we, once if we update the debt management policy, it will reference this policy as well. And this policy is referencing some of the items that are currently in the debt management, uh, yeah, the debt management policies. That's a separate but related matter that I think this committee might want to chat about, we can bring in our financial advisor just for some context. Uh, there's understandably some concern that's been expressed around us approaching $100 million in debt. And what does that mean? Is that something we can handle? And where are we going with that? And getting some outside commentary in that regard and to add some context to what that means um, to the bond rating agencies and all of that might be very helpful. Sure. Um, yeah, that, so I, that was actually a follow-up because I do see on, on page four there's the reference to the reserve funds and the debt management policy, and it talks about building a contingency reserve for this purposes of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand in comparison or in conjunction with the debt policy, is this an additional million-dollar reserve or is this, it a subset? This came directly from the debt management policy. That I is just directly from straight in because it seemed to relate. Okay. <laughs> Would but it yeah, be helpful to but, provide you a copy of that policy yeah, in some place? Because yeah. they go hand in hand. And then we we'll can yeah. send that electronically as yeah. well. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. And Any, please provide comments, questions. Any other questions or comments regarding the capital budget policy? Actually, I believe it's called capital planning, not just capital budget, right? Right. Capital planning. Yeah, trying to capture a larger notion that there's some forward thinking. 
Yep. Love it. Very good work. Uh, next item on the agenda is item number seven, a discussion on audit, um, the audit services RFP and legal services RFP. Um, before us is a draft. On yeah, on following up on your time. discussion at your last meeting, uh, we've supplied you a, a, a proposed RFP approach to auditing services, and this is something that we did back in 2008 last. Um, we found it to be quite productive and helpful last time. I think we've fine-tuned it a little bit, but largely it's intact. This is something that we could uh, put out over the fall and early winter months. Uh, we're currently under contract with Mac Page through the current FY16. Um, so we have a little lead time, but um, you know, doing a good thorough search and interviewing potential firms uh, will take some time. So that's something that uh, sh if we want to go that direction, we should start thinking about doing that over the, you know, certainly by first of the year, we ought to be out on the street at the latest. At the latest, right. Absolutely. Um, so the question to the uh, to the board, um, how would you, um, so I, I had a chance to look through this. I think this is a fairly standard RFP request that I don't see, I didn't see anything really sticking out at me to um, halt this from moving forward. Um, do you uh, gentlemen want to uh, review this um, a little bit further and bring this back at the next meeting so that they can get started? What would you like to do? Um, I guess where I was, I, you know, generally I think it's, you know, it's a pretty straightforward RFP. The only piece that I didn't see in here that we had talked about is asking them something about their deliverables and schedule for that deliverable because I think it was, we were trying to get to these numbers a little earlier. So something added to that effect. So maybe, much like these other things, Sean, maybe we should take a look at it and try sure. to bring it back. Get our, so I think I was going to ask you about the capital, but it sounds like get our comments to you. And then the next round of this, we'll take a look at these documents and try to move closer. But Tom, just being sensitive to what you yeah. said, what is our timeline that we would need to do to be able to get this out by year end? So it needs to go here, then to the council, I don't think no, it needs to go to council. Oh, okay. The council will do the ultimate appointment, but right. uh, your task, this committee is okay. tasked right. with sorting through this kind of, okay. to do, doing this, kind okay. of sorting through and delivering to the council a recommendation okay. uh, on who to use. Uh, on the issue of schedule, I, I do expect there's going to be a cost. There'll be a premium paid for accelerating that, potentially. So we could have, um, by virtue of the, have the requirements, one deadline, and then uh, indicate an earlier deadline and see if there's any cost differential for that. I, I suspect to have them that identify the, the differential. If we have it by the charter date of December 30th, this is what it would cost. If we want it done by September 30th, this is what it would cost. If we want it done by July 30th. So I guess we ought to decide on so how, how much we would want to ask them to advance the schedule. Right. Well, and some firms aren't cap won't be capable just because they have other municipal clients and they're, yeah. it's crunch time. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So the beauty of an RFP approach is that it's a little looser, is that you can encourage them to kind of respond more in a narrative or question <coughs> format as opposed to bottom line, lowest bid wins. There's a qualitative piece to this as well. So uh, we could get their feedback on an earlier timeline, what that would cost, what that yeah. would look like, what are the implications of that. Mm -hmm. Can you, right now, do we have a deadline established for our, our auditors? By charter, yes. By charter. Charter. Well, that's why I was going to ask. And that deadline is? December 30th. December 30th. And, and are they meeting it? Most yes. years. Yep. These last and two years with staffing issues, we've... And, you, we've and your opinions on the uh, issues that are associated with... Uh, getting it on that time frame as opposed to earlier? From staff's point of view, I, I'm not, we don't feel as though we need it any earlier. I think we need to see it, and the council finance committee needs to see it as you enter your budget process, which right. is, you know, April-ish, March-April time frame. So getting it in December, December gets it in your hands. Typically there's a presentation in late January, early February. I think that's what we did again this yeah. year. Um, and that's kind of right at the doorstep of when you're jumping so into budget. Really good lead in. Um, if we ask it earlier from them, it backs up Ruth and her staff because there's a lot of deliverables we need to give them right. uh, for, for them, them to, to put the financials together. So 
you know, if we're looking for November 1st, that's just, uh, or, or let's say sept September 15th, that's likely to be very hard for us to, to do. With, uh, with various new rules that auditing firms now have to contend with due to some major firms that were kind of in collusion with auditing firms in the past. I don't remember the names of all of them, but uh, essentially they and, can no longer Ron. prepare financial statements and audit their financial statements. So I that means we have it to. It would be important for us to understand what we would gain by asking for it earlier. Uh, because I've heard just what you said. Yeah. Doesn't sound like we gain any, yeah, anything. For them to retain the independence, they really can't be doing all the prep work. And <coughs> unless we provide additional staff and finance to be able to get that field work and stuff out to them earlier, done by us, uh, that's going to be hard to accelerate it too much. Yeah. Having a budget that so, gets approved would probably help that. I mean, we've spent. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, so I, you know, for me personally, I. I Sorry. <laughs> I can understand the, the um, desire to request additional time, and I think that if I understand the RFP process, the cover letter and the background on page three is what would cover any desire for them to address, um, including in their proposal, what, the what if. You know, what if we change our, our uh, deadline to the September 30th? Personally, at this time, um, I'm okay in moving this forward simply because this is consistent with not only our prior practices but with what is required by charter um, accelerating it is not required by charter it may be a desire um, i think it's a simple change to that uh, the client letter asking for them to input on you know what would it take you know give us in essence um, the section of the cost yeah. you know what, what the materiality of the proposal maybe that becomes a page two um, so i'm okay with waiting and reviewing this additionally I just, I just don't want to bog it down with some of the some things that haven't been decided whether we even want to do it yet, such as the September 30th. Well, to me, that's a charter question. That's not a finance committee. Well, I think if you have it earlier, earlier. the charter says it must be done by yeah. end of December. So if it's earlier, I don't think you're violating the charter. It's not much work to include here, kind of an open-ended question. Please provide a response, implications and cost of, uh, of delivering it earlier. And at least that's information we can consider yeah, I mean, and talk about and see if it makes sense. I, I would, I mean, my only suggestion, I mean, having done some of these, I would just go out with an RFP. I mean, whatever, work backwards from your schedule. I mean, the, the only piece for me to move it up is in case there's an audit finding, in case there's something we probably should know about it sooner than later. Um, but if you moved up to whatever was comfortable, whether it would be 1130 or 1030, um, just put that date out there and let them give a bid. Because a lot of times what they'll do on their first bid, if they want the business, they're going to give you a number. Mm -hmm. If the number's too high, then you can always go and say, well, geez, you know, if we gave you a little more time, would that produce a different number? But if, but if you say 1231, but give me a number for earlier, they're already going to give you a higher number for earlier. So whatever it's worth. I, the only other piece that um, I had intended to do, and again, uh, we haven't had the time to do it, is this is a school and town audit, so I need to oh, send yes. this to right. Kate, oh. and uh, oh. I don't know if yeah. their board gets involved or not, but uh, to well, let her know, review Well, that's, that's kind of the precept of why the September 30th needs to be discussed more fully by both boards. Because there's a big onus on both to accept. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. listening, I don't think September 30th is a reasonable mm. date, so but, you know. but even 11.30 sure. gives it a month. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, that's, a, that's a simple change. If we just put the expectation in the RFP 11.30 and see what they say, if it can't afford it, then we've got some wiggle room potentially. Sure. So from our perspective, this is Good way to fairly close to being ready to go on the street. Cool. Um, so um, what, is the, what is the desire of the board? I'm personally am comfortable in actually approving it as is with the modification of what we've just discussed. Um, if you two gentlemen would rather wait and we discuss this at our next meeting, I can do that too. I'm not. No, I'd be good to go with it uh, simply because uh, <clears throat> I, I doubt that I would be able to I'm sorry. You know, adva advance any suggestions that would be meaningful. I'm sorry. So I would, uh, for the record, move approval of the request for an RFP proposal 
uh, for audit services as presented by the town manager. Second. Questions, comments, further? No? Not seeing any. All in favor? Great. There you go, Tom. We'll get back to you once we have results. <clears throat> Uh, transitioning to the legal. I'm sorry, if I can just add, um, what has um, been the typical, even though we've got time, um, who typically reviews this? Is it going to be this finance committee? Is it going to be your staff and you? And I mean, who participates in that? Um, the this is a, a bit awkward. Typically, I, I'm the purchasing agent that, you know, I make the final decision. In this case, uh, it, the, the finance committee is tasked with, with this process. So. We'll administer the bids, we'll collect them, we'll uh, tabulate them, and if you like, be in a position to make a recommendation to you. Um, Most of them are also willing to meet as needed with the, the boards or whatever, so if they, you know, if you want to do that, we could. No, that. I'm fine. I just didn't know if. Uh, Would you like a presentation from the sub those oh, that the, submit? The top ones, maybe. That's something um, we should tell them as part of this. Maybe, yeah, maybe, I think as maybe um, if you narrow it down to the final Final, two, final list, yeah. Okay. The finals, that would finals. be nice. And I'd like to have, um, you know, uh, our school partners in that conversation as well. So right. there's a, yes. a joint acceptance, I think. Well, we'll just alert them that should they be a finalist, that the presentation would, would be part of the process. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Um, moving on, I think we're still in item seven because now it's about legal services. Is this the uh, Bernstein Shore yes, letter it that is. we received? Yeah. yeah, this relationship is a bit different than we started to talk about last time. Unlike uh, independent auditors where changes you know, might be good uh, in terms of having a fresh perspective, that's really the independence part of it. I think there's a lot to be said for relationships when it comes to legal services, uh, assuming, of course, we're getting quality legal advice um, from our current firm, which I think we are. Um, rather than giving you my opinion about the relationship, and I, I'm pleased to do, the, do that and I can, I thought as a, as a starting point, um, I tasked them with telling us more about the relationship because it predates me. In fact, it started in 1969, the year that we changed our former government from town meeting to council manager, and have had a continuous relationship for 46 years with this firm. Um, until three years ago, interestingly, uh, two of the principal partners uh, were still actively involved, um, you know, providing legal services. They both have transitioned out, and uh, that's been a bit, not rocky, but just the transition, it's never easy, but um, I'm very pleased with the uh, assemblage of um, attorneys they have uh, and kind of the, the way they've set themselves up, selves up for uh, specialties and kind of ease of contact uh, for, for myself and my staff. Um, I think there can be further improvements. What I would suggest in this regard is that um, really because of the longstanding relationship and I think the good service we've received is that the committee uh, could meet with uh, the managing partner and at least Phil Saucier who's the, the lead municipal attorney for us and have a conversation, I think we can negotiate a better deal, maybe a preferred rate, uh, given our historical relationship. Um, I think we deserve enough to at least have that conversation with them. I can't imagine the millions of dollars we spent through the years with the, with the firm. Uh, incidentally, they're celebrating their 100th anniversary next month. Um, wow. Wow. And Councilor Donovan can speak better than I, but they are one of the more I'll say respected yeah. firms in this part of northern New England. And as the, as the law profession has progressed, they have done a good job of uh, finding smart young lawyers uh, and creating kind of the specialties that are required in this day and age. Uh, the days are gone of a general practitioner, it seems. No question. Uh, very highly regarded. Uh, uh, Lex Monday is an association of law firms across the world, uh, one per state. Uh, so to be the one in the state of Maine is uh, prestigious, and it does afford you the ability to um, transact business anywhere in the world, because you'll have a fellow law firm there uh, in whatever country or whatever state. That'll be uh, another large respected law firm able to uh, carry out whatever your needs are. So. 
And I believe um, the town's policy um, or the council's policy is to simply review or evaluate the services. Um, so um, unless the board, this board here, feels that we need to take any type of action on that, I, I would be comfortable in simply submitting this cover letter or this letter from Bernstein Shure um, to the full board as kind of our report. Um, this is kind of one of those weird areas because uh, like uh, auditing, we have to actually approve something every year where this policy just says we evaluate it. Right, if I remember the, the policy right Yes, now. if you don't mind, I'll read it. Yeah. So it will be the policy of the Finance Committee to evaluate legal services every three years and determine if an RFP is warranted. The Finance Committee will make a recommendation to the Town Council. There shall be an annual meeting with legal counsel to discuss legal services. Has that happened, the annual meeting? To my knowledge, it never so. has. So, so I guess, Sean, where I'd be, I'd yep. I think what, what Tom offered, it would be, be great to me to get the principal here. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the thoughts that I had, and if, you know, if, you know, maybe a negotiation, but one thing that comes to mind is, and especially, Tom, that you shared, service was great, then I got a little bumpy with some transitions, mm -hmm. now you think it's good, mm -hmm. but maybe talk to them about, you know, sort of where we are, why we're doing it, and maybe introduce the concept of whether this could be some type of performance guarantee that every year, you know, we kind of evaluate their services and, we, we, we develop a checklist or something about what your expectations are as what exceptional service would be from them. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of make that an annual process. We sit down with them and have a conversation about did they hit it out of the ballpark or didn't they? And what does that mean? I, I think it would be great to fall into that routine. It's, it's high time. I have met with them and, and at least uh, introduced the fact that this is coming up yeah. for discussion and, and have been given assurances. I voiced my concerns with some of the rockiness and transition um, and they responded incredibly well and I think that's been rectified and I don't expect it will be repeated right. at this point. Uh, but I, I would love you to be part of the conversation, frankly, for a little muscle. Uh, yeah, I think give you some cover. Uh, having your involvement in the conversation will help, uh, I think, negotiate a better deal at the end. Sure. Um, so the, the, um, to tie into what I recommended, I would still recommend providing um, this letter to the council as a whole with a cover page that will recommend that we uh, also have a meeting um, of the, I think it needs to be the entire council. Um, the, secondary, uh, the second piece of that though is that I would like to understand, a little, um, so thank you by the way for having that, because uh, I think it's important once I heard that we need to meet. The one thing I want to know in advance is that sometimes those, um, because you're dealing with performance um, and it can be about individuals who represent us, um, whether or not this needs to be an executive session meeting. Because I know like with, typically with most performance-based type of evaluations and conversations for confidentiality reasons, you need to, and if, the, if cases are brought up, then it needs to be private. So I'd, I'd want to understand that in advance so that we protect Good point. them yeah. and us, right? Yeah, it may well be that you get into some substance of ongoing litigation as part of that conversation. I think we'd have to be careful. Oh, plus you're talking about individuals, people's performance, and that should be right. private. Sean, I'm just, I'm just trying to, I was kind of thinking that the conversation with the principal would be the finance community, and then we'd report out. But it sounded like you're thinking about the conversation with the principal should be the whole council. Is that I, what I would think so. The policy of the council delegates that authority um, to the finance committee. Well, I'm... That's my reading of this policy. I'm just thinking because of that issue that, that the three of us is a yeah. smaller number um, than, than seven, and seven I usually get much more. So I was just thinking because I mean, um, isn't the chairperson typically involved in the more high-profile cases um, in setting agendas and, and understand? And being, mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking of the other participants. I, I'm happy with it just being the three of us. I don't want. I just don't want to offend the other four members and saying sorry. We're just going to do it here. I mean, I'll take whatever you guys. You know, the, 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 it, it's what you're trying to do, I think, is create a, 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 a better understanding of what the relationship is, who the people are, uh, your confidence in them. So uh, you, the point about the chair being a participant makes mm -hmm. some sense uh, because, oh, well, oh, and, and, you know, um, and the fact is that the current chair is leaving, and who knows who the next chair yeah, is so going to be. Yeah, it could be one of the th other three members that aren't in the room. Right. So, uh, so maybe for this year, we'll go ahead and schedule something with 
just the three of us, but I right. do think in the future the chair. Mm -hmm. and, and we can give them an opt out if they don't want to participate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's their choice. Great. So perhaps I can work with you and we can yeah. find a date. Uh, that, that might need to be a special meeting. Just uh, it'll be an hour or better itself, probably. Absolutely. Good. How, uh, have you thought about how we would broach the subject of uh, uh, a better deal? Uh, whether we would, uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, kind of best client deal, you, you base it on what are you giving to other clients of a similar status? Uh, but, uh, I'd be interested in picking your brain offline sometime to see yes. about how best to approach that. I've certainly uh, advanced the notion that that's what I expect uh, <clears throat> will be part of the conversation. Yes. And they didn't seem opposed to it. it I also didn't put a number on the table. No. It, it is very difficult. That's one of the reasons I asked them, tell me what the going rates are because depending who you're talking to about what the rates different right. Right. Um, you know one of the simple things that we can change in our relationship is we've paid a retain monthly retainer and I have always wondered what we get for that and um, they provided a response I'm still not sure that it's a value to us it's um, so that's that's potentially a savings they, that we can get right off the bat. So they, was that three thousand a year or three thousand a year? Um, it's three thousand a qu it's it's quarterly. It used to be 4000 yeah. Somewhere along the line, they figured out that quarterly is only three times a year. I don't know. It's but. not much money. It's only four grand. It's four thousand. It's a thousand dollars a quarter. Oh, okay, so that's an easy. Uh, it, it's uh, then credited against the bill. The bill. Of course. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's almost given. It's a municipality. It, mm -hmm. It's I have, an unnecessary element of the relationship. I have Tom Cruise in the movie The Firm in my head right now. Yes, I, I, I like the book better. <laughs> it was, but no, that's good. Good point. I think it Thank was you. also maybe I could be totally off. Was that it was supposed to give us not quite first option, but it gave us more uh, clout, if you will. They would they would respond to us more so than or quicker, maybe. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's Genesis the way they described it was that the, particularly with financial related questions, Paul Frinsco, Ruth would have a question that you know, might take seven to ten minutes, and rather than clocking time, those kinds of things were just kind of thrown, oh, the retainer covers that. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have those sorts of needs now. Right. And we have a bond um, Financial. that's very, there's a box around that project as mm -hmm. opposed to, um, Booth and her staff are pretty up to speed on things and isn't, aren't relying on legal in input very much anymore. I also asked them for an overview of where we've been spending money recently, just so you get a sense of it. I mean, I appreciate that you're, and, and I'm somewhat removed. Um, a number of my key staff are authorized to contact legal directly. I don't need to be involved. I'm going to review that and tighten that up further. Um, but just to get a sense of where we've been spending um, legal time. And, and that changes year to year, obviously. So good. I'll work with the committee chair to come up with a date and time that we can meet with them. Thank you. Excellent. Um, with that, uh, future meeting uh, dates, times, and items. Um, any items that uh, we? I, so I have as follow up. I have um, um, some understanding about uh, projected or estimated fund balances and seeing where we currently are. Um, and I'm, I'm simply looking at the current year, you know, based on our year-end statements and then all these adjustments and non-adjustments that we didn't make. I also have the, um, a follow-up from way back uh, talking about dashboard metrics. I know I failed to deliver on a promise with that, so I'll get to work on that, um, about providing a sample that um, I used in corporate world. Um, we talked about potentially having a meeting with our, is it at the bondsman regarding our debt policy? Is, it, is that the right title for the person? Financial advisor. The financial yeah. advisor. Yeah. And then I also have um, about meeting with the attorney. Um, the next um, meeting, we are going to have um, the capital planning policy for approval on the budget. Um, maybe some of these other things as well as the, maybe we can incorporate at the next meeting that, that meeting with the attorney, by the way. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a big part of it. That might work. Those two things? Yeah, perhaps. those two things. And, some of the the one thing I did want to ask uh, uh, to put onto that table 
I'd like to know um, where we are with last year's audit and meeting any of the uh, recommendations from the auditors. There were a couple of recommendations, if I remember correctly, just to see where we are. Um, one of them I did want to um, understand better was about, if I remember this right, was about expense reporting for key managers, that there's some, there was somewhat of a deficiency because key managers had to approve their own or there was, a, there was some type of process issue that the auditors said that really should be um, kind of adjusted. And so I'd like to understand that better. Um, and then potentially um, the, where I'm going with this is that the boards that I've sat on in private life, are primarily nonprofits, generally the board approve, um, is the one who reviews certain expense um, reports. Um, typically for the most senior executive to make sure there's no uh, funny business, I guess. So I don't know whether we need that. I just want to know, understand what the auditor's questions were regarding that and if there's something we need to do so that it no longer becomes an issue. Or we simply mitigate it by saying we accept the deficiency going forward. No, I think we've, we've you got, know, you know we've got going with responses. This? With their internal have. controls are in place. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that there are, and I don't want to. I just want to make sure that if there's something that we can do, just to, other than hiring another person, which I know would be extremely helpful, um, I just want to make sure. I kind of want to understand that so that there's no issues. That no, the we'll audit comes we'll up. provide the audit recommendations. The I think response. there were two, and and what we've done to rectify those. Absolutely. Believe me, we don't want audit recommendations to repeat themselves. Um, also. Just because I, we just uh, finished the tax billing process um, and it's now at the printers, I was updating the final 2016 budget and we still need to allocate the contributions to the other agencies. So um, I just wanted to keep that in everyone's minds. Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, I get it. That's a good point. And that was what, 60000 Something yeah. like that. So um, I will reach out to the chair of the Rules and Policy Committee to find out what that recommendation <laughs> is so that we can then it's within it. reach. <laughs> and actually, I'm, I'm the holdup. I finally got in touch with the United Way guy. He'll come and talk to us. So okay. he's looking for. So it's still in the committee? Yeah. Okay. I've been the holdup. Yeah. I'm trying to get in touch with Dan Coyne. But I'll make sure I put it on the uh, future items list because we do need it. We can need to take care of it as soon as possible. Yeah, I know Colette's getting calls from folks that are just wondering whether they're getting anything and right. what, and how much. Um, any other items that we need to kind of put no. on our agenda? At some point we talked about, and I think Tom mentioned it, and I think you mentioned they're working on that sort of strategic capital plan. What's 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 the next three to five year window as we look at it? I, I know that the municipal side is looking at that. Um, I think we're hoping that we Yeah, we've got a 20-year outlook that um, is kind of at midpoint. We're starting to put some numbers around project descriptions. Um, and I'd be interested, maybe we can have a conversation around how to involve finance committee, full council, and even public at some point. This process has been driven internally by my senior management team, um, but we need to widen, broaden that conversation. Absolutely. Um, so this actually kind of ties into, because as the list gets longer, we think about the meetings that when we have them. So uh, right now they are the second Wednesday of every month, except for November. Um, I can't remember why, I just remember holiday. it's a holiday. Um, so we'll need to select a different time in November. And then, um, as well as um, kind of confirm if it's going to remain, even though there might be a new chair, um, I would hope that uh, any new members coming onto the board, even in current, would simply uh, um, move things forward and not necessarily stop them. But I think that we could go ahead and maybe schedule something for December. Or I think everyone will be in tune with each other. Um, and I'm okay with continuing it through the second Wednesday if everybody else is at 4 o'clock. Right. The question is in November, when do you think is the best Ooh. time? What is the holiday, by the way? Which holiday is in Veterans November? Veterans Day, maybe. Oh, Veterans Day? Okay. I, yeah. I'm not sure, but that would be right early November. Yeah, that makes sense. What would, be, what would make sense? Obviously, you get too far. You're then dealing with Thanksgiving week what, and the vacations. Third Wednesday that month? Um, so the Should third Wednesday that month would be a council meeting, and we've tried to stay away from that, right? Yeah, fair enough. We do it Tuesday, Thursday. What about Tuesday? Yeah, let's do it Tuesday or well, Thursday. So Tuesday is election day, um, the second Tuesday, right? Yeah. No. No, that's actually, no, because the first Tuesday is the election, right? First Tuesday yeah. in November. Always. First Tuesday is always election. the election. So Tuesday that's Tuesday in November. Just do it the day before. Yeah. Let's do the second Tuesday, Tuesday in November. Okay. We'll get that date out to you so you can get it on your calendar. Good. Yeah. And that will be at 4 p.m. And that's the first for September. Yeah, that's good. I'm sorry, October. 
Um, so regarding the strategic, maybe that could be a really nice introduction for the new chair of the Finance Committee. <laughs> and we take that up in December. Yeah. We'll set the agenda for that person, lucky soul. <laughs> so we'll book uh, out through the end of the year, so to speak. So we'll get October, November, December meetings scheduled. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, any other items? Cover? No. Um, Motion, uh, well, actually, I, there's a public, there is a public comment section. I forgot to open it up with uh, that, so I apologize because we didn't have anybody. Um, and there's actually no one, well, I shouldn't say there's no one here. We have no two very fine, staff. very fine staff members here. Would, would either of you like to get up and speak? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, call out how great we are, I don't know, whatever you'd like. Um, if there's no objection, move to adjourn. Second. Second. There you go. <laughs> All in favor? It's unopposed. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Perfect.